mix of, of, of solutions, it's very difficult to see. We certainly will uh, share this uh, presentation with you uh, afterwards. But what one can see is actually, you know, if we really want to decarbonize and go to net zero, we have to talk about the fuels. And every one of you knows this, yeah? But talking about energy efficiency a lot is possible already. Not only today, it was possible actually already 100 years ago. There was oil tankers like this one going entirely by wind, yeah? And I have even found photos of huge oil tankers from 1890 even, yeah? So it's same with e-mobility, no? 1910, there was like, no, more electric cars uh, in proportion uh, on the road than, than maybe today, no? So it is possible, uh, but certainly the new designs look different. So question, is this a rendering or is this a real ship? It's unfortunately still a rendering, but if you look at this one, the small one on the left is real. It's an inflatable sails. That's new technology coming up now. And the, uh, um, the prototypes went very well. So now they're thinking uh, no, to scale it up and bring it on these huge, uh, huge, huge carriers. No? I'm very excited to see no, inflatable sails of this scale. Yeah. Certainly, we all know Enercon, no, as a sustainable German company, uh, having even four Flettner rotors uh, uh, on the ship. But uh, I think in the world, there are not too many more than maybe like 20 or so in, of this scale. No? So may not be the solution, but good to reduce CO2 emissions. No? Those sales are also coming up. Is this a rendering or is this a real photo? This is true. It's real. And I'm really happy to see you know, how big these sails are actually now becoming, uh, almost 40 meters. And uh, uh, another example for wind-assisted propulsion. No? I think this one went just like end of 23 uh, 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 um, uh, on the sea. I I'm not too sure, but it's very recent. Yeah, uh, And yes, there is already others experimenting with it. No, Is this a rendering or is this a real photo shot? It looks more like a rendering, right? But it is reality, even though uh, this photo is constructed. So I think with Airbus, they uh, already applied such a system here on this ship. And it's actually beautiful to see that uh, there is uh, big, big, big ships uh, uh, aiming at deploying such uh, solutions. Welcome, sir, Mr. Patrick uh, Crean. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you for being there. The easiest way, and uh, there a lot of ports already have this regulation mandatory, and I know most of you are well aware that at least when we are not on the sea, let's try to get the electricity and if possible, green electricity in the ships, right? So port of Rotterdam, Hamburg, and especially these uh, passenger uh, uh, ships, no? They are already mandated to actually not have any diesel genset or whatever run on the ship once they're in the harbor, no? And that already contributes to uh, 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 the emission reduction, no? But can we actually go by battery over the sea? We always hear hydrogen is for heavy duty and uh, battery, uh, maybe passenger vehicles and some smaller ships, but big ships. I mean, that's already a little big, right? 23 electric propulsion ferries made in India for 50 to 100 passengers, uh, financed in, in mainly by German Development Bank, KFW and Kochi. No? You're all aware of the Kochi water metro, no? Can it become bigger? Yes, it can become bigger, no? In 2019, a 200 passenger and 20 vehicle ferry uh, was already in operation. And... Uh, Oh, the, the best photo is not even there. <laughs> Sorry, it's not there. there. There should be a photo of a ferry with a 50, it's a container ship now, which had been launched, 50 megawatt hour battery, 50 megawatt hour. Sorry, that's like, that was the highlight of the, this. I don't know how it could happen that the photo is not there. Those who are interested, please uh, know, it's this Costco container ship. 50 megawatt hour, 50 megawatt hour. That's only possible with battery, battery swapping, no? But we are talking about uh, a huge amount of containers, no? A huge amount of containers. 
Then energy efficiency measures, measures no, you must have heard about electric, uh, no, uh, the way of uh, with electricity generating bubbles uh, uh, under the ship to actually make the ship uh, uh, float, no, um, different uh, um, ducts, right? So these are all things that can be done. Uh, uh, but at the end, no, to decarbonize, no, and this here scenario uh, again by DNV, we need to get rid of the oil. We long term also have to get rid of the gas and uh, yeah, switch to uh, uh, ammonia, switch to e fuels, including e methanol, e -me biomethanol, electricity, right? So, in conclusion, no energy efficiency measures, uh, measures no, are not enough. Electricity, short distance, maybe even the largest uh, uh, battery powered boats, they are running on rivers and not cross ocean, yeah. Biofuels, wonderful solution, but in a carbon neutral world, we may need the carbon actually as a sustainable source of carbon also to produce plastics and other things we are now doing with oil, right? So uh, at the end, no, we are talking about switching fuels based uh, on electricity and there are certainly different options are there and you're all aware of. Uh, and and there is no magic in it. We can convert no the LNG carriers already to uh, electricity based uh, LNG carriers. So so one is saying like ninety nine percent of the of the ships can be quite easily converted. Actually, no, there is such examples. No, for example, here the El Blue in Germany already running on uh, LNG produced uh, based on electricity. Then everyone is always no pointing out Maersk. No, those twenty five methanol ships ordered by Maersk. No, uh, six ocean vessels amongst them. So uh, sixteen thousand five hundred containers. So that's big, right? And this has become a reality. I think this one has been just launched a couple of days ago. Yeah. It, for those you know, who are in the sector, seeing this makes us happy. It really makes us happy. No? That, 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 that is something. No? That is a, and that is not a study. This is not a rendering. This ship is running on uh, uh, methanol, and Mass has committed to run it on 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 sustainable uh, methanol. So uh, methanol uh, with the uh, with the uh, uh, carbon no uh, being uh, net uh, uh, zero, so to say no. So uh, this is wonderful developments. And if you see those engines here no uh, running on uh, on on methanol, this is really exciting. This is really exciting. And if we look into the DNV order book, we see okay. If all the orders now come, we will see 32 of those kind of ships already coming uh, this year, no? And then maybe up to 230 and more in 2028. And this is not projections. This is order book today. So we know what's in the order book today, thanks to the DNB uh, uh, database, right? Uh, hydrogen fuel cell, yeah, it's possible, yeah? Here, 300 passengers, 80 cars, then we all are aware now of uh, coaching shipyard having uh, got the uh, task to now build these two ships for uh, the Dutch company uh, uh, Samskip. So very, very excited, running on fuel cell, not burning the hydrogen, right? Um, but compared to methanol, nine ships are foreseen to come no, with the ship orders uh, of today in 2024. Hydrogen uh, 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 powered uh, vessels where they're burning the hydrogen six are foreseen to come online uh, 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 this year, no? Uh, but then let's also don't always confuse with the carriers, no? I sometimes have a lot of people which are telling me it's possible, look, uh, here is a, no, no. These are ships which are carrying hydrogen, but they are not, using the hydrogen in the fuel cell or burning it. I know you know that, but I think when we communicate, no, we always have to make those uh, things clear to the public. Same with ammonia. So these big carriers coming up, but they are not using ammonia as a fuel. But there is, there is. So this ship here, uh, uh, 40,000 uh, cubic meter green ammonia carrier and fueled uh, by ammonia. So these ships are coming thanks to another German company. Please, my Danish friends, I have to promote because they are unique in the world. What Emma N is doing there is truly unique. 
they are um, uh, putting uh, those engines together and first delivery for uh, ammonia uh, engine uh, uh, in, in, in 2024. No? Uh, just here, another example for, 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 for a, a green ammonia fueled uh, container ship. No? That's foreseen 2026. Some other uh, renderings. No? And if we see what's happening in the ammonia space, because everyone is saying no methanol or ammonia, then everyone is coming up. Yeah, you see Maersk. Maersk is actually looking pretty much into ammonia, no? but methanol is easier and it's like available. So it's not available in the way we want it today, but it, it, it's like within the next 10 years, closer an option maybe then, no? but ammonia is coming. No? So... Uh, these ships exist, and the most exciting is actually, you know, those ships, and they're Norway and other countries are very strong, where they actually don't burn the ammonia, yeah. but where they have ammonia fuel cell. Also, wow, that is, and at this size, I must say, it's like, just to see this makes me happy. Yeah? It's possible to have ships run on ammonia fuel cell uh, of this size. And certainly knowing that if green ammonia will become so important, people look in who knows most about green ammonia. And many, many agree that Argos would be a very good source to kind of like bet on information related to green ammonia, right? And this is a forecast of, let's say, you know, someone who believes in ammonia. But if we believe a believer, then you see that uh, green ammonia offtake globally until 2050, more than 60% actually is foreseen to be used for ships. And then power, no, uh, relatively small compared, we don't know. And as a uh, hydrogen carrier, what we are talking now, no, exporting green hydrogen from India to Germany or, or Europe uh, uh, is only maybe one third or less compared to what actually ship engines uh, may take off. And with this, I will end. I just now saw the last Clarkson's research. Now they're like, for those of you know, uh, who are in the shipping, now these are like the consultancy, the Bloomberg of ships, so to say. Yeah. And uh, no, this statement actually made me really happy. No, 45% of all new build ships in 2023. Uh, capable of running on alternative fuels. So certainly this includes the LNG carriers, which can be switched and so on. But still, I think we are, we are, we are, we are on a good path. We are on a good path. And, and, and the time to take the decisions for the ship orders is now. So uh, with this, uh, thank you very much. I took maybe one or two minutes longer than, sorry for that. <laughs> But yeah, I'm really excited also then to hear from you, uh, Josephine, no, about the fuel EU maritime legislation. No, if if EU ship any ship above five thousand tons, which leaves Europe or enters Europe, has to reduce its emiss emissions fleet wise by two percent, and EU allows that only one ship in the fleet can refuel one hundred percent green, and this is accounted towards the emission reduction target of the entire fleet then any ship coming or leaving Europe, passing by India, should and will consider, probably, yeah, India as a refueling, as a bunkering station. No? And if India has the cheapest electrons in the world, the cheapest green electrons in the world, then India may be also able to produce the cheapest fuel, the green fuel in the world. And there is a lot of those ships which are passing by India. So now let's invite them to refuel in India, green, and you become the green gasoline station of this world. Thank you very much. That's very interesting keynote address. We now have a round of uh, very enriching presentations. Our chair for the day, Mr. Ara Rashmi, distinguished fellow of Kelly, and our co-chair is Ms. Josephine Tyson, Council of Maritime Royal Daniel Community. Uh, we do have an uh, opening remark by Ms. Josephine, but we also have Ingrid joining online. And I believe she also has to go for another quick we meeting. Can check. We quickly if check we can with check. her if she wants to go first, and then we can have opening remarks. So, uh, Ingrid, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you. I'm here. Uh, would you want to go ahead with your presentation first, since you have another meeting after? 
Sure, uh, I, I can do that. Uh, thank you so much for the for the invitation and, and for um, for having me in this meeting. Uh, so uh, I would like to share some slides. Um, if I can do the start. There we go. Right. Uh, I hope you can see that all right. Um, so um, my name is Ingrid Sidemaljugo. I'm a project director with the Global Maritime Forum. We are a Copenhagen-based uh, not-for-profit uh, organization working to shape the future of global maritime trade. Um, um, sorry, can you hear me all right? Yes, you are. Okay, perfect. Um, so the Global Maritime Forum, we um, are very proud to host the Getting to Zero Coalition, um, which was established in 2019 together with the World Economic Forum and Friends of Ocean Action. And here on the photo, you can see uh, some of our members um, in, a, in a workshop we did here in, in Copenhagen. So uh, the Getting to Zero Coalition has more than 200 members um, and it's a community of stakeholders from across the maritime value chain. Um, and here you can see uh, some of our members. Uh, as I said, we have we have more than 200, so I can't show you all of them, but here you can see that it's, uh, it's a group which consists of uh, energy companies, uh, shipping companies, banks. Um, yeah, you can see on the right-hand side, Avada, which is an Indian company that uh, is one of our most recent members. So we're very uh, lucky and proud to have them along with, with all our other members. Um, so the Getting to Zero Coalition is about um, uh, decarbonize, decarbonizing shipping. And um, thank you. Um, so we, uh, we said, so our ambition is to have commercially viable zero emission vessels operating on deep seas from 2030 towards full decarbonization by 2050. Uh, so once we had uh, uh, gathered our, our uh, community around that uh, ambition, we needed to figure out how, how do we do that? And one of the first things that we needed to do was to, to come up with a number. What does it mean to have commercially viable zero emission vessels? So uh, we uh, worked together with the uh, high level climate champions and our knowledge partner, UMAS, uh, to uh, define a, a a fuel uptake target, which is 5% of scalable zero emission uh, fuels uh, by 2030. Uh, and that would then put us on um, on track to towards full decarbonization by uh, mid-century. Uh, so as you can see here, the, the transition would then be take the shape of an S-curve. Uh, so after the 5% initial uh, uptake in, in 2030, uh, the, the uptake would increase quite quite steeply uh, after 2030 and to build us on track. Uh, so this uh, uh, transition strategy was uh, developed before uh, the adoption of the greenhouse gas strategy of, of the IMO. Uh, but so we're very pleased that the IMO has, has now uh, endorsed uh, the 5% target. It's not exactly the same uh, wording. Uh, but but we 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 completely stand behind that IMO target and also the intermediate uh, targets for 2030 and 2040 towards uh, full decarbonization. Um, so once we had developed this uh, uh, transition strategy, we developed an action plan where we identified five uh, levers uh, for how to reach uh, our our targets. Uh, and with uh, uh, us having this action plan, it means that we can also assess uh, the progress that we're making uh, on the different levers. Um, and we uh, now we do an annual tracking. Uh, we just published our uh, second iteration of the, the, the progress report uh, in uh, October of last year. Um, and the, uh, the progress is uh, color, color coded here. So green means uh, on track, yellow means partially on track and red means not on track. So if we start from the left-hand side, we can see that in the technology and supply, uh, there, uh, the picture is a bit mixed. 
So with good progress on the development of uh, technology, uh, R&D, and quite a good progress on um, 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 pilot projects and demonstration projects. Uh, but there is also some red, which you can see, uh, and that's uh, that refers to the production of scalable zero emission fuels, where we see that the, the pledges that have been made uh, will not make up for, uh, for the 5% needed. Um, if we then look at demand, we can see that there is a majority of red, meaning that demand is not on track. We are not currently seeing sufficient uh, orders of zero emission vessels or zero emission ready vessels, um, which means that um, yeah, we, we need to accelerate uh, our efforts uh, in, that, in that sense. And with, with us not having sufficient uh, vessels in the order books, it means that the shipping sector is not sending a strong enough signal to the supply side. So uh, if we make progress on the demand side, there is also a chance that that will be reflected in, in better um, uh, numbers on the uh, technology and supply side in, in, in the next iteration. Uh, the finance lever, as you can see, there's quite a lot of yellow, so partially on track. We can see that there's a good um, alignment around IMO trajectories from the lending institutions, um, as demonstrated by um, the Poseidon principles. Uh, and there's also been uh, some uh, progress uh, when it comes to public finance into shipping's energy transition, so especially from, from the US side, but also uh, from the EU. Um, and uh, now I can't see my own slides here. Uh, and on, uh, on the bottom left, you can see the policy lever where there's a, a bit of green, a bit of yellow and a bit of red. Uh, so the green is obviously because of the progress that was made um, by the IMO in, in July uh, of last year when the IMO adopted its revised greenhouse gas strategy, uh, as I mentioned, which is quite aligned with the, with the uh, ambition of the Getting to Zero Coalition. And there's also been good, good progress on the regional and, and national level, uh, both including uh, like the inclusion of, of shipping in, in, in the EU Fit for 55 scheme, for example, but also on the supply side where we, we've seen the uh, a spread of the develop of um, hydrogen strategies. Um, and India is also a country where there has been quite some progress on, on the policy side with the development of the center of excellence and so on. Uh, civil society uh, is also fairly well on, on track. Uh, there is a need to continue to work with civil society, not least to ensure uh, that there's good progress on, on, uh, on, just, on a just and equitable transition. Um, now, let me see if I can move to the next slide. Not working. Uh, so this is a slide that uh, from another tracking we do, where we track the number of pilot projects uh, in the maritime space. Um, so as I mentioned, we started the Getting to Zero Coalition in 2019. Uh, and at the time, uh, there were uh, 69 uh, pilot projects that we, um, that we could notice. Uh, and here you can see that there's quite a significant increase um, so we are now uh, in our latest tracking at close to 400. Um, and uh, as you can see, the, the majority of the projects focus on uh, ship technology, which was also demonstrated in the slide with the, with the technology lever that I, that I showed earlier, uh, but also good progress on, on fuel production um, uh, and also on bunkering uh, on technology. Uh, and the last... Uh, uh, tracking that we do is we track the progress when it comes to uh, green corridors. Um, so green corridors, I think it's probably a familiar concept to, to many of you, but those are specific uh, shipping routes where the feasibility of zero emission shipping is catalyzed by a combination of public and private actions. Um, and we, we do an annual tracking of, of green corridors. Uh, this is a, it's a fairly new concept, but with a lot of traction. 
Uh, and what we could see in this latest um, uh, tracking uh, report is that there were 45 green corridor uh, initiatives that had been uh, announced and half of them were announced during last year. So quite a, a, a quick um, uh, progress there. Um, and they are at various degrees of, of maturity, but actually multiple corridors have been clearing a, a progress state and are deciding on the priority uh, of fuels and setting targets for uh, operation. Um, and, and beyond the numbers, uh, evidence also points to the fact that green corridors are actually triggering pre-investment activity. Um, so what you can see here on the slide is, uh, again, uh, different color codes, depending on, on what type of, of uh, ownership or leadership there is behind the corridor. So, uh, there's a combination of red, which is government-led corridors, uh, blue, which are industry-led, and then uh, purple, which are uh, port-led, uh, and green, public-private. And you can see on the top left uh, uh, side that there's quite a, a concentration of green corridors in, in Northern Europe, uh, but there's also quite a, a good spread. Yeah, across the globe, um, and and there are you know various reasons for engaging in in green corridors. Um, so it can be about manifesting you know maritime leadership for a, a country um, or or a, a, a port. Uh, also about energy leadership if if you have like you want to play a leading role in energy security or energy um, production and supply. Uh, it can be about climate leadership, um, but also about making sure to be a front runner when it comes to, to innovation and technology. Um, and it can be about developing and strengthening trade relations. So there are really multiple different uh, motivations uh, for, for engaging here in Green Corridors. Uh, so um, I know that we're, time is a bit short, so I'll just uh, wrap up here with, with some recommendations of, of uh, what uh, we think needs uh, to be done, because uh, maybe to summarize what we can see is that there is a lot of traction, there is a lot of action, good policy progress, but we are partially on track to meet our targets. So we really need to, to step up and, and to do what we can uh, and I wanted to say a few words about the IMO, and I know that you will hear more about uh, the IMO from from a previous from a um, uh, an next speaker. So I will not go into it so much. Uh, but the the progress that happened at the IMO in July was really significant, with the adoption of the the full decarbonization target and and the intermediate targets and the well to wake approach, for example. Um, but the process that is happening now at the IMO is is equally important because now the the delegations are um, designing and developing and eventually adopting policy measures that will enable the implementation of the strategy. Um, so I think it's really key for um, for member states to engage um, proactively in the in that process and also for industry to make sure that. Uh, that their voices are, are heard, so voices of, of support for, for ambitious measures. Um, and then to align national policies, um, so to make sure that um, that the ambitions that are expressed in the in the UNFCCC when it comes to climate uh, uh, targets, that they are actually reflected in national policies in, and um, also in the maritime area, but also when it comes to energy production, for example. Um, so that's a recommendation. Um, collaborations. I mean, this transition is is uh, so big and complex that no actor can do it alone, and the shipping sector needs to really work in collaboration with, with finance, with energy, with other off takers of of the new energies like uh, aviation, agriculture, mining, and so on. Um, and yeah, to support green corridors. Uh, uh, looking in the in the long term, uh, we will all need to uh, to transition. Uh, but in the in the very near term, green corridors are really key and crucial for developing the solutions and exploring the solutions. So, uh, continue to to support them as a final recommendation. So that's what I uh, had to share for now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew.
He's been told that uh, Catherine Kushan would like to go next because he's a bit pressed for time. Sorry, Josephine, you might go after. <laughs> but that's uh, okay. I'm in closing. Um, so we have Captain Prashant, Head of Public Affairs, South Asia Miles, who will now work with all this. Unmute uh, Captain Prashant. Can you hear us? You're on mute, Captain Prashant. Yes, uh, I can. Can you all hear me well? Yes. Super. Um, <clears throat> uh, can I please also have the slides uh, from, from the room, please? Super. While, while those come up, uh, let me just uh, start by uh, saying uh, good day to all listening in. Uh, I'm, I'm Prashant Vij, uh, and I lead public affairs, including our DCAB and ESG agenda for Mersk and South Asia. Um, thank you uh, to Terry, uh, the Indo-Germany uh, German Energy Forum, uh, the Embassy of Denmark and India, Global Maritime Forum and other partners uh, for the opportunity uh, to allow uh, to uh, have us at, as Musk uh, to outline our DCAP uh, journey, but also more importantly, the needs of the industry uh, to future-proof ourselves, right? Um, and and uh, Tobias, uh, thank you also uh, for, for stealing the thunder uh, to a great extent, uh, but I think uh, it's great and uh, fully agree that um, with Man Energy Solutions on our side uh, with the engines, uh, then it's, it's uh, of course uh, great that we've been able to put put our vessels out there um, so so great collaboration and partnership uh, which is key i'll just wait for the slides to come up uh, and then and then straight dive into it it's an image of my presentation with a link to the website each time you click on it you, you go the, back to the website you are the base <laughs> You have to click escape to get out of it. It's not a website. It's just an image. Yes. Escape, escape. <laughs> so I can recommend everyone to visit the site, right? You can get a free account. Yeah. Oh, wow. And uh, uh, no, uh, for those of you know uh, interested in, in in the topic, you can really see what's going on in the world and and really track these uh, ship build orders. Uh, it's it's updated, uh, I guess, on a daily basis. So uh, yeah, fantastic resource. Right. right. Thanks. Um, next, please. Yeah, uh, just uh, a few words here, right? Uh, from from, a, from as AP Mola Maersk and an integrated logistics company, uh, facilitating global trade. Uh, then, of course, um, global trade trade enables us uh, and, and people across the world, right, uh, to do with opportunities. But at the same time, it also translates into impact on the planet and the societies in glo globally. And it's critical for us, right, uh, to take responsibility um, of this. You can see uh, from the slide here, um, uh, when we go next, uh, that the, the part of the problem is the fact that uh, shipping, uh, can we go one slide back, please? Uh, is the fact that uh, we have 850 million tons of carbon emissions uh, in 21, but that's only increasing uh, and, and, and subsequently uh, from the pandemic to today. What's important for us to highlight is that despite these uh, decarb targets that we have, we, we, we see that there's a continual increase in the global uh, emissions from the shipping sector. For us at Maersk, um, it's, it's also about the 700 vessels that we own and charter that actually contribute to this in a significant way. And a do-nothing approach in a, in a climate crisis that is, that is real is not a flat line. It's a, it's a down curve. As industry leaders, uh, we have a responsibility and, and that's what we take um, uh, to, to make sure that we can decarbonize our global supply chains. Our purpose, which is to improve life for all by integrating the world, is where we are committed to leading the decarbonization of logistics, but at the same time also making sure that it is a green and just transition. Next, please. 
when we talk about our decarb journey, uh, given uh, uh, we are an integrated logistics company, our commitment goes beyond reducing just emissions from the fleet. So we do cut across the modes of transport and the products that we offer, including the terminal operations, trucking, rail, barging, air, warehousing, you name it, right? Cold chain, e-commerce, and, and so on and so forth, right? So it's really about decarbonizing the end-to-end -end logistics. We've set ourselves ambitious target of, of being net zero by 2040, and, and at the same time also holding ourselves accountable to the public uh, uh, with setting some clear near-term targets for 2030. This significantly strengthens our ambition, but at the same time, we've also gone ahead and actually anticipated our net zero ambitions, which were previously a 2050 by a decade to actually now achieve uh, this by 2040. So that's really our way of demonstrating that we walk the talk um, uh, and, and, and truly in line with our purpose. Next, please. When it comes to our industry, right, and, and uh, Tobias showed some pictures um, uh, of, 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 of the vessels that we've now had in water, we were up with this chicken and egg dilemma uh, of, of whether we should be building vessels first or we should actually have green fuels out there, right? And mm -hmm. we believe that we can actually impact the value chain on both sides, uh, the supply and the demand. And therefore, in 23, we actually launched the first um, carbon neutral liner vessel operating on green methanol using a dual engine technology, enabling it to sail on either methanol or traditional um, very low sulfur fuel. But the ambition there was really to go one step further. And today we have last month introduced one of the big vessels, which we've also see here, um, which, is, which is one of the 24 vessels that will be coming out over the next couple of years. When they are all phased in, we will actually save 1.5 million tons of CO2. That's corresponding to 5% of our fleet emissions uh, from, from 2020 baseline, right? That's the demand side. On the supply side, we've signed several partnerships. Um, portfolio of those annually sourcing green fuel. It's not about just being the one that's the first that is important for us. It's, it's actually about generating a movement in the industry. Since our first order, um, as, as we saw uh, DNB being credited before, we have... 200 more vessels that are on order, right? And that's where it's a significant spillover effect. You can be leaders, but you also need followers. And that's what we've managed to actually create and then drive this industry in the right direction and thereby driving a tangible impact um, into, the, into the green value chain. Next, please. When it comes to uh, the demand of green fuels, and this is something where we see India having a huge opportunity, right? Um, Simply with the vessels that we are on order, we will have approximately 30 million tons of green um, green fuels that are required by the end of the decade. And the, of that, it's going to be about 5 million tons that most will alone need um, uh, annually. Um, it's important that when we do this, that there is a difference, there's a bridge that needs to be overcome here with the price gap between green and fossil fuels, right? That needs to be closed. While there's a clear demand signal for production of green fuels, a global sector like shipping needs global regulation as opposed to patchwork of national or regional regulations. And there, I think, um, as Ingrid mentioned, and we'll hear from the IMO as well, it's crucial the role that we will have them playing um, and, 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 and something which we are very um, uh, much looking forward to. Next, please. When we look at the um, what what we actually achieved in July last year, I think it was a landmark agreement, uh, and and kudos to uh, the IMO there. And now uh, working on the uh, reduction measures that needs to be accelerated to achieve a level playing field between green and fossil fuels. That's something which we expect um, uh, you know, as part of the upcoming um, uh, year uh, and and the work there that IMO adopts a strong uh, fuel standard and a pricing mechanism. Um, and that's very much in sync with achieving the closure of the price gap while also covering the well-to-wake uh, emissions. Next, please. Here is a classic example uh, of, of what uh, was spoken about earlier as well uh, of, of collaboration. 
um, being the key. And that's something which we believe here is a, a, a product that we don't have that can be uh, sort of purchased off the shelf. Uh, it's an ecosystem that we are building and, and collaboration is going to be key. Uh, the challenge that we have clearly is the, the green fuel uh, at the moment at cost competitive price levels um, and, and, and something which can be then uh, having enough um, uh, on, on the, on, uh, to, to fuel this transition. As I said before, India has excellent conditions um, uh, and, and clearly it has a window of opportunity. Uh, with renewable energy, there's huge focus um, and, and the right leadership, direction, uh, policy environment. Um, we also have you, uh, the, the right, uh, Mr. Bhattacharya spoke about the hydrogen mission. Uh, clearly a lot of impetus there. And then as an agriculture country, nation, um, with, with a lot of biogenic carbon, the good carbon, as we call it, from biomass, biogas, the, the, that there's again the, the right ingredients that we are required to produce green methanol at scale, right? So that's something which we clearly look at. What I have on this slide is a, a classic example of how partnerships work, right? And how can we actually create ecosystems? The India-Denmark Green Strategic Partnership, which you've heard about, has actually gone ahead and launched the Green Fuel Alliance last month. It's with a primary objective to promote sustainable energy, where India and Denmark come together and create an ecosystem. Um, uh, but, but that's where we have stakeholders across the business, the government entities, uh, research institutions, academia, financial stakeholders, right? And, and, and simply with a vision to be a catalyst uh, for business opportunities with a mission to accelerate the development of green fuels in India. While we have joined this, um, uh, this, this particular alliance from an, from a, from an off-taker lens of, of, of green fuels, if there, is, um, if there are interesting ideas um, uh, and, and, and potential suppliers that, that would like to hook up uh, and have a conversation with us on hydrogen derivatives, please do feel free to reach out uh, and then we'll be happy to have that. Next slide, please. As you can see, um, uh, as and I, I mentioned, right, it's, it's uh, this this Green Fuel Alliance of India is is including ten pioneering uh, Danish organizations and then three advisory board members, and it's already growing as we speak. For Musk in India, that and we we basically drawing on on over hundred years of of relations and 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 being present here in the nation. We clearly think that there's a huge opportunity. Um, we want to be a partner, um, a sustainable partner. That's important. Um, you know, for for trade um, uh, and and tech and of course uh, the the people um, in India and while we do that we want to make sure that we can engage with these basket of activities here right uh, engaging learning sharing knowledge building strategic partnerships collaboration is the key we truly believe India has a huge opportunity um, not just for green fuel production but also bunkering as mentioned before. So very much looking forward to partnering as most um, with India um, and 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 beyond to make sure that we can we can go ahead and achieve um, what we've set out for ourselves. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Yes. Now we we'll want to Ms. Jyoti Harrison, who has been waiting for quite some time in mind. Take a word with the audience. Thank you. Well, th thank you. And I hope um, you can hear me clearly also um, online. My name is uh, Josephine. I'm the Maritime Council at the Embassy of Denmark, based here in Delhi. I'm here to work on a uh, maritime collaboration with our Indian counterparts. I come from the Danish Maritime Authority, where I worked uh, on EU regulations to decarbonize shipping. That was my main focus. Um, I was part of, or I was leading the team who negotiated uh, the maritime elements in the Fit for 55 package. I'll get into those. Um, also, just want to say Denmark is, an, is a very proud maritime nation. We're happy to have uh, MASC as part of our um, national identity, I would almost say, but there are also ma many other uh, maritime companies. MAN comes from a Danish uh, company, we have to remind ourselves. And uh, the ammonia engine is uh, very nicely displayed in uh, Copenhagen. So um, yes. just uh, just a few remarks on that. Um, I will share with you some of my experiences from working on EU regulation, what they entail, what they mean. I will also touch upon IMO regulation and the Danish views on this, what we mean, what we believe uh, they should include. 
And then I will finish off by elaborating a little bit on how we intend or hope to collaborate with India on this maritime decarbonization agenda. But um, the scene has already been set. We know that the maritime sector is a polluting sector. It accounts for almost 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we know it's a big challenge to decarbonize. We've seen examples of how we're moving in the right direction. This is positive. Um, and therefore, we also know that the solutions do exist um, and, that, and that we can promote, uh, or that we should promote them. And um, we also know that while the, the industry is pushing, they're also pushing because the customers, us as people, we're demanding these sustainable solutions. So this is a factor. And it's also uh, a, a point I want to raise here is also an opportunity for more development. Uh, it's it's there's an e economic advantage in this if you want to uh, grab it and and Tobias already highlighted some of that. Um, good, but let's go into the EU. Um, the EU is is globally a front runner uh, on decarbonizing. We want uh, climate neutrality. I think the the goal was 250. Now it's uh, the European Commission has presented a new goal of climate neutrality in 240. Let's see if uh, the EU member states adopt it. And as part of the, the, we cannot decarbonize without also including the maritime sector. The maritime sector has been sort of ignored, I, I would say, before the 50-55 package. Now it's uh, in there. And there are a number of tools um, to, uh, to decarbonize. One is uh, the EU emissions trading system. We've had that for numerous years. Now the maritime sector is included in it. And we include it, and the way we do it is that we put a price tag on the emissions that we emit. Then we set a certain number of credits. Those credits will fall, gradually increasing the price, gradually also increasing the incentive for energy efficiency measures. And there is another uh, relevant directive, which is the Renewable Energy Directive. My energy counselor from the Embassy of Denmark uh, should uh, would also know a little bit about this, but basically... Um, the Renewable Energy Directive defines what we see as renewable energy sources. It also defines how many of these renewable energies should go into a hard to abate sector like the maritime. This is a crucial thing, because one thing is to mandate the production of the renewable fuels, but we also need to mandate where they go. We've heard earlier speak, talk, talking points about it. The maritime sector cannot just be electrified. We also need to create those fuel cells that can take them on, on long-haul uh, shipping. Then there is, um, and I'm just mentioning them briefly, but uh, then there is the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Regulation, which is uh, also an old regulation that has been renewed uh, now. And um, it, the interesting part about this is that it mandates our European core ports to be able to develop, deliver not only shoreside power, but also other alternative fuels. They are also mandating LNG. They are also saying that down the road, you need to make a plan for other alternative, real climate neutral fuels, such as e-methanol, such as e-ammonia, and so on. Good. Um, so now we have sort of that set up. The, the key uh, regulatory tool that was laid out in the 655 package for decarbonizing the maritime sector is fuel you maritime. It is a flag neutral uh, regulation, as, as Tobias already mentioned. It, all ships sailing in the European waters, all ships sailing in and out of the European waters will have to comply to the fuel you maritime regulation. And there are some flexibility mechanisms, etc., included in it, but, but this is, this is the, the, the standing point. They have to be above 5,000 GT, but that's the majority of them anyways. Um, the fuel EU maritime is, is a fuel standard. They, we regulate how carbon intensive our fuels can be in a time span from 25, so it will start next January, and until 250. Uh, it will start at 2%, and then it will increase to 80% in 250. We might see that change now with the new regulation coming or the new uh, climate goals of the European Union, but, but thus far, this is the goal. Then you can ask, why is it all the way to zero or to 100? 
reduction in 250? Well, it's not because you want to meet the requirements of climate neutrality by also using the emissions trading system, the energy taxation uh, directive, etc. So it's a basket of measures that takes us to zero. Um, then another interesting point about fuel year maritime, is it also mandates our ships to use shoreside power uh, in the ports where it's available. And this is also part of decarbonizing and, and, and taking one of the low hanging fruits. Uh, to one point more in fuel year maritime is that what we want to achieve with it is to, to make a push for demand of the greenest fuels out there. And one of the, um, the hopes that the Danish government uh, worked for, and one of the things we also saw uh, see in the regulation, is a sub quota for, the rene for renewable fuels of non-biological origin. These are e-fuels. We believe that we need to mandate ships to also find some of their compliance through the greenest options, because these options are extremely, while they are there, they are expensive, they require uh, investments, and we need to, sh to show those on the supply side that you can invest because we will demand it. So that was um, Julia Maritime. Now, while I am, uh, I've so been so devoted to the EU regulation, also having worked on it quite uh, intensely, it is not, uh, and this might be controversial to say, it is not ideal um place to to regulate maritime shipping as my colleagues before me have already laid out maritime traffic in the european union only accounts for about 15 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions from the shipping sector thus leaving a lot of emissions out of the equation therefore we need uh imo regulation and and the signal that imo leaders sent last july is an enormous step in the right direction. It sets, sets the path towards a greener future, to coordinate, so to say. Um, now we need to find the tools to deliver on the, that strategy. And here the, the Danish government, which I to some extent represent, are quite, quite clear on what they think uh, we need. We, it's quite clear that we cannot only use one measure. We cannot only have a GHG price mechanism. We cannot only have a fuel standard, as Prashant has already also said. We need a combination. We need a so-called basket of measures. One that bridges the gap between fossil fuels and e-fuels. One that creates an incentive for going green and again sending the signal to the global fuel supply um, side that, that we are ready. And therefore, we need to combine a fuel standard, uh, a fuel standard with a flexibility me mechanism to get all on board with an economic instrument of some sort. There are various tools on the table here. Um, and the reason why we also need the economic instrument is not only to bridge the price gap, but we also need it to generate revenues for those countries, those part of the industry who needs a little bit more help maybe to, to actually also finance this transition. This is a, a key element, uh, which brings me to, to the last uh, point here of the Danish priorities is the principle of just an equitable transition. We cannot realize the ambition set out in the IMO GHG strategy if we do not get all on board. This is key to, to everything. And um, and that takes me then to to the final point here, and why I'm also so happy to be in India. Um, we need global collaboration, multilateral collaboration, but we also need bilateral co collaboration, and we need to bring together those who are devoted to the green transition, those who are knowledgeable about it more so than I am, and uh, and we need to. There is a quote uh, in the Indo-Danish um, um, collaboration under the Green Strategic Partnership. Where Modi is uh, known for saying, India has the scale, Denmark has the skills. I don't think, uh, I think India has both the skills and the scale, but the scale here is 
really, really important. Uh, you have all the right in ingredients to, to be a future maritime hub uh, for these new fuels. You're already working so intensely on it. Three hydrogen hubs have been identified. Policy recommendations are coming out for decarbonizing some segments of the sector. It's all moving in the right direction. Coming from a relatively small country, but a big maritime nation, we want to, to not help, but we want to work together with India on this specific agenda. We have some pioneering companies, stakeholders back in Denmark, not only within renewable energy production, but also for the ships, design, manufacturing, engines, while well, some might say it's German, but we have all these, and, and here is the scale and the skills, and let's combine it and work for a greener future. That was my message. Wow. Thank you, Josephine. That was really insightful. We have one last presentation before we move on to the panel discussion, headed by the chair and the chair. So this final uh, presentation is by Mr. Doyle Winders, Head of Air Pollution and Energy Efficiency with the National Pipeline Organization. A very good um, morning still in London. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Um, it's a very rainy London here, and uh, I, I see your happy and sunny faces, so uh, I have a bit of uh, FOMO, especially because I was uh, in India last October myself for the Global Maritime India Summit, which was organized in Mumbai by the Ministry of Ports and, and, and Waterways, and it was a great event uh, back then in October, and I, I was very honored to be part of that and to participate in quite a number of panels that really highlighted India's potential and India's active uh, involvement in, in shaping the future of shipping. So it's, it's great that these discussions are continuing and that you're having another dialogue here today about uh, India and uh, India's role in shipping, in global shipping. Um, I prepared a couple of slides. Uh, I'll keep it short. I'll, I'll, I'll promise. Uh, I think we have seen a lot of information already uh, displayed by the previous speakers and quite a number of uh, references were made to IMO and particularly our greenhouse gas strategy. So I hope you can see the slides. Um, let me also thank, of course, the organizers um, for inviting the IMO. As I said um, already before, my, my presence in, in India just a couple of months ago was, was great to have uh, such a close dialogue with our Indian partners. India is an extremely active uh, member of the IMO and is heavily engaged in, in all the ongoing ne uh, negotiations, discussions, particularly on our climate framework. Um, you mentioned, or quite a number of you mentioned, uh, the great achievement that IMO governments uh, have delivered. And I stress governments because um, I'm working in the IMO secretariat and, and support the governments in coming together, reaching consensus. But in the end of the day, it's really the task of the governments coming together in the IMO to set the regulatory framework that will help the decarbonization or that will frame the decarbonization of shipping. <laughs> And India played, as I said, a key role in these negotiations. And we can also see that in the further development, uh, the discussions that we're having today within the IMO on uh, shaping the, the binding measures, the regulatory global measures that will achieve the reduction targets set out in the IMO greenhouse gas strategy, India again plays a, a very crucial role. Now, very short, uh, what did governments agree upon last July in the strategy that is to, to reach net zero emissions for uh, global maritime shipping close to the year 2050? And in doing that, um, the IMO in its implementation of the strategy needs to promote a just and equitable transition, which also takes into account different yeah. national circumstances. And I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later in, in, in my presentation. What are we doing today? 
Um, some of you mentioned it, the previous Josephine, you, you mentioned uh, what, what's happening um, already uh, today in the IMO, that is namely the development of, of measures, the next set of uh, global uh, regulatory requirements, which will apply to the global fleet. Um, these discussions are ongoing on the, on the basis of a number of proposals that have been submitted by groups of countries to the IMO. So and your, uh, your presentation is not visible to us. Have we shared the screen already? Okay, sorry. Let me. Can you? I, I'm on slide two now, so I'll, shall I stop sharing then? No, we, are, we can't see the slides. All right. Yes. Yeah, now Is that any better? Yeah. yeah. All it's right. Screen. Good. Anyway, what I wanted to tell you and what the, some of the previous speakers already highlighted is the very ambitious uh, reduction uh, scenarios that we have set out in the IMO. So between uh, now where we are today to achieve net zero uh, emissions uh, by 2050, uh, member states have agreed actually on, on a number of uh, uh, points on the trajectory towards net zero, and that is uh, to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions between 20 and 30 percent by 2030, and between 70 and 80 percent by 2040, and also to work towards uh, the target of a 5 percent energy usage by 2030. I think some of the pre uh, presentations before highlighted um, how, uh, how much is actually happening uh, in, in the shipping industry around the world in terms of new builds. Uh, I saw the number of Clarksons, about 45% ready uh, ships that can sail uh, on renewable fuels or alternative fuels. And again, back when I was in India last October, we also saw uh, in the, the expo area uh, that came along with the, with the conference, uh, a great number of initiatives, including from Indian ship owners, uh, shipyards, on um, available uh, low carbon technology and fuels. So there is a lot happening. Um, what we do need to look into and what we're currently doing within the IMO, and that's uh, actually through an impact assessment that we are carrying out right now, um, is what are the impacts of the various measures, particularly the proposals um, for a low carbon fuel standard for carbon pricing, uh, and what are the impacts on uh, potentially uh, increases of maritime transport costs around the world? Uh, we heard already um, the existing cost gap between um, current fuels, heavy fuel oil, and the renewable alternatives, which is about four to five times uh, more expensive. So if you want to close that cost cap, um, I think we, we have uh, the tools and we have the proposals ready uh, to Since do that. Slide is not changing. We, are on, what, we can see slide three at the Just moment. put it up from your side otherwise if you want to. Because is that all right? Maybe you can send the uh, screen and then... Otherwise, I'll just talk you through it. It's it's all right. I think you have seen a lot of the information already. So, um, so we're in the midst of this impact assessment right now. And... It's very important for, for, for the IMO and particularly for member states, uh, member states from the global south, that we do this impact assessment to, to make sure that the decarbonization of shipping, which is a key sector for the world's overall energy transition, um, will not lead to any negative impacts for countries, particularly those in the global south, um, due to um, lack of accessibility to the world's markets, um, lack of competitiveness because uh, their ports are not on the main shipping routes. And uh, of course, the, the downstream or the calculation of the increase in maritime transport costs for the end consumers. So this is a crucial process that we're heavily involved in uh, together with our, our member states. Uh, 
uh, we are actually seeing uh, a lot of information coming from from different governments uh, that feed into this process, and that's extremely helpful to to have an uh, in evidence based decision making that involves all the IMO member states and uh, including those from the global south. What's very important, and and this is uh, something where I can see uh, a lot of uh, synergies also within India is the collaboration between the shipping industry, uh, which is often referred to as a hard to abate sector, with a number of other sectors, um, such as the cement, steel, aluminium production. And uh, in, that, in that sense, I was very pleased that uh, I recently read actually about government guidelines uh, for the use of green hydrogen and shipping and steel that have been issued in India jointly by the Ministry of St uh, steel as well as the Ministry of Ports and Shipping. And within the IMO, we're really focused on, on creating these synergies. We know that shipping is a key to the overall energy transition of the world. Uh, shipping, like it does today in transporting oil and gas from the different uh, production areas in the world to the large demand areas in the world, will also be the only transport mode that can effectively transport renewable hydrogen from production places like India that have a huge potential to places like Europe, North America, America East Asia. So shipping can drive that transition. And um, through the IMO and the various tools and programs that we actually have already in place, including our, our increased focus on a just and equitable transition that sounds uh, very progressive, but we need to collectively work on, on making it happen. And we have um, uh, in, in IMO a specific resolution that focuses on technology transfer, technology cooperation. And so I'm quite pleased to hear that uh, our colleague uh, from, from Denmark and, and uh, our colleague from GTZ particularly highlight this uh, ongoing cooperation, bilateral cooperation, that focuses on technology transfer and tra technology cooperation, but because setting a target is relatively easy, making it happen, making it a reality, and making sure that there are no countries that will fall out of this decarbonization trajectory is also uh, crucial if we want to have a, a really true, just and equitable transition agenda. So this is where we are today with the NDIMO. I'm going to wrap up here. So measures setting a carbon intensity standard um, in combination with a global economic pricing mechanism, which will be actually the first global economic pricing mechanism for a sector, a global sector, uh, are on the way. But we do want to look seriously into what are the impacts on states of these measures, particularly uh, access to fuels, affordability of fuels, competition between different sectors and uh, making sure that no country will fall out of its current uh, um, role and position within the overall global supply chain. So that is where we are today. Uh, India is a, is a true partner in this endeavor, and we look forward to cooperate with everyone in that process. Thank you. And apologies for the slides, but um, I've sent them over, so feel free to distribute them. Thank you so much. We now move on to the panel discussion. Our chair for the day is Mr. Ara Rashmi, distinguished fellow Terry, and our co chair is Ms. Josephine Palace, um, Councillor Maritime Royal Danish Embassy. We have a fantastic panel of speakers with us. Our speakers include Ms. Prakriti Sethi, India Chief, Methanol Institute, USA, Mr. Sanjay Nagrare, President of Sior Energy, Mr. Deepu Surendran, from CSL and Dr. Patrick Rehan from CAA. Over to the chair and the future. So, thank you, Apurva. And <clears throat> with permission from my co chair, let me begin. Um, uh, this is an interesting area of which we are discussing uh, future of uh, the shipping sector. <clears throat> and uh, from the presentations, we can see extremely um, uh, positive pictures are emerging. Uh, a great deal of effort is being put in. Of course, uh, the proof of pudding is in eating. Uh, as um, uh, Royal uh, was pointing out, it's easy to set targets, but making it happen is the real challenge. 
So <clears throat> what are the issues involved in putting it on the ground? Uh, for uh, And, and um, I'll not go into the issues once again, but clearly the two uh, fuels uh, of the future which are being pointed out are the green hydrogen and the methanol and the green ammonia. Uh, each one of them has its own logistics and uh, its own economics uh, and technical feasibility. So all of them, the technical experts know better. Uh, question is, uh, how is the shipping industry going to take it up? Uh, from a from a overall a global uh, emissions point of view, because uh, there are life cycle issues also involved here. Uh, even if you use it in one particular uh, sector, there are other sectors where the production is being uh, is taking place and consumption is taking place somewhere else. If you put it all together, maybe the net effect is still not positive. So you have to really take that into account uh, when you use the uh, choose the fuels and you choose the market based measures. Now the two the two measures which are being talked about is one setting the target in terms of proportion of the energy. The second is the sector. The within the shipping sector itself, you can have separate segments uh, where you can uh, prioritize. So which are the uh, strategic uh, options which uh, the shipping industry is likely to choose? Uh, that will be an area of interest. Uh, so to help us understand those issues, we have uh, these four eminent speakers. So let me first invite Mr. Deepu Surendran, who represents the Cochin uh, Shipyard Limited, a very major um, uh, player in the Indian shipping uh, industry. So uh, over to you for your view, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, from a uh, shipyard point of view, uh, this international uh, shipping, the IMO has uh, put up that target for GHC emission. From Indian uh, point of view, more than international uh, shipping, domestic shipping is a major thing because India is having more than 7,500 kilometers of coastal line and uh, 14,500 kilometers of navigable land waterways. A lot of uh, small ships and ferries are operating in Indian waters, around more than 10,000 10, vessels are operating. The major challenges are transforming or uh, transition of these type of vessels into greener fuels. And government of India is taking a lot of steps uh, in line with uh, this international regulations uh, to meet the target of uh, net zero ESG emission from the domestic uh, ships also. Uh, there are various uh, policy or guidelines promulgated by government of India. One is uh, green transition project. In India, around 350 to 400 uh, tax are operating in various ports, uh, in uh, Indian ports. And from the, this, uh, this green tax transition uh, program, Government of India has uh, issued these guidelines for transition of all the uh, tax operating in Indian ports to be green by 2047. That can be achieved only through step-by-step uh, -step various stages and uh, initial stages, it will be uh, different uh, fuel or alternate fuels are required for achieving that target. Initial stages, it will be with uh, uh, battery hybrid and uh, initial stages already announced. Uh, uh, major four ports are asked to occur two tucks with alternate. Uh, and next stage, it will be uh, 25 percentage by 2030, 25 percentage of uh, the uh, tax operating in Indian ports with uh, alternate fuels. Can be uh, electric hybrid, then methanol, hydrogen, or ammonia. Not uh, initially, it, it cannot be green or can be any, any of uh, this kind. And finally, by 2047, it should be green and 100 percent vessels operate, uh, tax operating in uh, ports shall be with uh, green fuels. That is a huge opportunity in India for uh, others to collaborate with and uh, making uh, this transition. Another project uh, or uh, program announced by government of India, uh, Ministry of Port Shipping and Waterways, in the last month, month of January is Green uh, uh, added now program. 
that is for uh, this program is targeting uh, to the uh, inland waterways ferries and drop axis there are um, around 10000 vessels are operating and uh, transition of that type of vessels uh, that program is already announced and as per that uh, the target is uh, by 2030 uh 30 percentage of uh, uh carbon intensity reduction uh 30 percent of carbon intensity reduction from the current level has to be achieved and by 2047 70 percentage of carbon uh, reduction intensity has to be achieved and transition of uh, green, uh, to green fuels 50 percentage to be achieved by 2033 and uh, 100 percentage by 2045 This is the target, and uh, to achieve this, the, uh, not only the fuel has to be developed, infrastructure has to be developed, and uh, ships has to be constructed to meet uh, these requirements or operating with this type of fuels. This is a big challenge, and uh, there are opportunities. And uh, for this green transition, also uh, for this green Harit uh, Nagar program. there is a proposal for uh, developing methanol small uh, engines which can be used for this type of smaller vessels in india that is also under active consideration by the government for developing uh, or manufacturing in india under uh, uh, atmanirbhar policy of government of india there is a uh, that program will be coming up uh, in near future for developing these type of smaller vessels or uh, smaller engines for smaller vessels uh, that is uh, that is a good opportunity this can be achieved only through collaborations with other countries we believe that uh, this can be achieved my right. first yeah. Very thank you they're very interesting and um, this whole business of target setting the very fact that you have The, the there are targets numbers on the table this itself is a very major step and i'm sure this is music to the ears of my co-chair mm-hmm. parison uh, so, so this is the the approach which the global uh, players have taken and this is the first step taken so like in the just like in the area of energy transition uh, once you have the megawatt or the gigawatt numbers as your target then you start building the road map so the road map will have to be laid out obviously once you know where you have to go so thank you very much for that kind of input and uh, that's a so joining us uh let me uh, the next uh, speaker i think somebody is on the uh, on, online prakriti sethi fine sir uh, she is uh, the india chief of the methanol institute we would like to hear you ms sethi Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity uh, and uh, I would like to share a brief presentation if there's a possibility uh, I do understand there is short of time uh, but I think giving an overview in terms of <clears throat> having in, uh, an interest in the methanol sector because I belong to the methanol industry I think it would be best if we can sort of share uh, you know um how the methanol industry has been tracking the progress in terms of the shipping industry so i believe if you can see my screen um just allow me a moment ah uh, can you see it now still on the screen okay ah uh, i think now it should be yes okay So um just to give you an overview uh, I am Prakriti Sethi from the Methanol Institute uh, Methanol Institute is basically a global trade association for the methanol industry we sort of are a member driven organization and we were established in 1989 and we've been uh, sort of working with different regions um, because methanol seems to be a very growing uh, <clears throat> I would say alternative fuel and chemical product are in different parts of the world these are our members uh, and you would see that you know there is a wide range of members that we cover uh, because we're trying to capture the whole market and uh, sort of bring in the whole value chain together and there's an interesting aspect in terms of looking at the tier 4 uh, which sort of accounts to about most of our members and uh, you know we we see a lot of interest coming from the maritime industry uh, we have mosk 
uh, we have CMA, CG, uh, CGM. So I think uh, that is where exactly uh, the demand is also going um, in terms of looking at methanol application side. So I think that is a big, big uh, you know plus for our industry to look at uh, how the demand drivers are taking shape in this particular sphere. As you would see on the next slide, you know, there is basically um, a track of renewable methanol projects. So I believe in the couple of uh, previous uh, conversations regarding, you know, the blue, green and different color coding that's sort of taking shape in this particular uh, industry in terms of looking at carbon intensity. Uh, we've been also tracking uh, different renewable methanol projects, as you can see on your screen. Uh, we have sort of, uh, you know, differentiated or categorized into blue methanol, um, low carbon uh, emission methanol, uh, biomethanol and e-methanol. Um, we are tracking this on a regular basis. And uh, this is an interactive map that you can sort of uh, look at on our website. I've also provided the link. And we see close to about 80 renewable methanol projects already been announced. And um, we have projected that, you know, uh, close to 22 million metric tons uh, of, uh, I would say, renewable methanol projects would be uh, implemented uh, or would come into place uh, by 2028. So that's a very ambitious, uh, I would say, target uh, uh, in terms of the maritime industry also approaching most of this uh, renewable methanol demand uh, to explore uh, the maritime industry. Uh, on, on the screen, you would see you know, uh, the players that are sort of uh, taking this or leading this movement, spearheading this uh, methanol movement. And uh, they've been announcing a lot of projects uh, in terms of how they can scale up the production of renewable methanol. Uh, I believe in terms of this is more international. When, when you look at um, India, you know, uh, biofuel seems to be the low hanging fruit. Uh, so as to say, you know, utilizing methanol, um, biomethanol for projects like um, agricultural waste or municipal solid waste, which can be utilized, utilized for the maritime industry sector. And uh, as my previous um, speaker also mentioned in terms of how methanol could be uh, beneficial for smaller scale segments, um, you know, for inland waterways, which would be very beneficial as a starting point uh, because uh, methanol is still at a very nascent stage when it comes to India. And I think it can eventually um, move to uh, looking at how they can be uh, uh, bunkering or refueling hubs uh, because it's, uh, methanol seems to be uh, growing uh, when you look at Europe, which I'm going to talk about in my next slide. <clears throat> so this is just a brief in introduction in terms of we've been working in uh, with, with different stakeholders with the maritime industry and tracking in terms of, uh, you know, how regulatory aspects or whether fuel systems, safety, cost, uh, covering these aspects in terms of uh, the maritime industry for methanol. Um, and we came up with this report recently, which can be accessed on our website. Uh, and, and it gives a brief overview uh, in terms of how methanol could be utilized as a maritime fuel. One of the game changers in terms of, uh, you know, uh, methanol has been Musk. And it was also mentioned by uh, Prashant previously that uh, Musk has been uh, leading this movement and they announced that they want to go carbon neutral and they launched uh, the Laura Morsk uh, this year, uh, um, last year actually, uh, in terms of looking at how uh, you know methanol could be utilized and announced dual fuel vessels as well. So already 25 dual fuel vessels have been announced by Morsk. So I think this is something which is a game changer uh, for the methanol industry as well. And uh, the 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 main push for Morsk, I believe, uh, in terms of having this, uh, um, um, you know, um, uh, leading this movement was in terms of having a customer push. Uh, in terms of how they can go carbon neutral. So I think that is a very big main aspect in terms of how we can also encourage the industry to move forward uh, in terms of looking at, uh, you know, carbon neutrality targets. Uh, even even previous, I think, session, uh, one of my colleagues also mentioned in terms of uh, MAN engines that have been announced and been uh, in operation in terms of utilizing methanol engines. And already 152 large two-stroke methanol engines have been in place and a lot of orders have been placed in terms of, uh, you know, uh, looking at methanol dual fuel engines. So I think that is something which is very te technical, which I will not go through. Uh, in terms of the policy and safety guidelines, uh, apart from what we do, um, there are different associations like International Association of Ports and Harbors, Lloyds, China Classification uh, Society, who have been covering such guidelines uh, to support, uh, uh, you know, a safety uh, handling manuals uh, for, for the industry. Apart from that, the ports have also been very helpful in terms of developing these um, guidelines, such as the Port of Rotterdam and the Port of Singapore. Um, fast water in uh, in Europe 
uh, they, they also released uh, recently a, a report on methanol supply bunkering and infrastructure, which could be a, 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 a you know a, a reference document in terms of how uh, things are shaping place in terms of uh, handling uh, methanol uh, bunkering methanol in, in Europe. I think uh, just to point out in terms of quickly in the policy drivers, uh, you know it's very important that we look at how. Uh, demand inducing GHG intensity um, standards with penalties based on LCA could be uh, could be something which could be introduced um, from the policy perspective. It's very important that we sort of see a well to wake approach. Uh, you know how we can have a very comprehensive understanding of um, you know the whole whole carbon intensity of the industry from production to supply to distribution and even to the end uh, consumer, which is which is very important in terms of uh, looking at uh, the life cycle assessment. So a well to wake approach is something where we usually uh, advise our stakeholders, which would give a very comprehensive overview in terms of how uh, we can reduce our carbon intensity uh, with, with, with different sectors, because it's a very allied sector uh, with with uh, you know uh, looking at these 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 initiatives uh, from this different aspects and sort of having a very comprehensive overview of the whole value chain together. I think second point would be in terms of uh, having fuel mandates for sustainable fuels, um, which is very imperative in terms of you know giving an impetus um, to the industry to to sort of move forward. Uh, and encouraging them to have uh, uptake of more sustainable fuels. Uh, this has been done uh, as as it was being talked about with, with the EU uh, uh, fuel maritime industry uh, uh, initiatives. So EU has been doing a lot on that. And I, I believe uh, with regards to India uh, on the transport sector side, uh, you know, there have been mandates um, for um, putting in place the fuel blending part for methanol as well. And even I would talk about, you know, different uh, fuels. So I think there is a need for the shipping industry to also come into play uh, to, to put to put mandates and standards for encouraging uh, more utilization of sustainable fuels. I think it will not only encourage uh, the adoption, but uh, it will also sort of bring in, you know, the R&D, the research and development and more technological advancements in terms of how uh, different fuels could sort of also diversify the energy mix because it's very important for a country like India. You know, it's it's a huge country, so we cannot really rely on one particular fuel. But it's very important that uh, you know we we have that diversified energy mix, uh, and it's it's important to give that impetus as well. Uh, in terms of the supply side, uh, you know, it's very important that uh, we look at how we can reduce the opex for the first movers. Um, methanol itself is is something which is uh, uh, which is being traded quite uh, quite extensively in close to about 120 ports uh, because it's predominantly being used as one of the chemical products. Uh, so it anyway sort of has an advantage, uh, added advantage um, uh, to sort of reduce uh, the the uh, cost, capex cost as well. But it's very important that we see you know how infrastructure um, incentives can be provided uh, to reduce. Uh, the OPEX cost and have a very, um, you know, uh, a robust um, supply chain in terms of looking at the first mover advantage as well. I think apart from that, uh, a, a lot of policies initiative have been talked about how we can encourage different e-fuels or hydrogen, um, ammonia, methanol, uh, but there's also an important uh, emphasis given in terms of financial intensive uh, <clears throat> uh, initiatives that could take place, you know. Uh, there could be uh, incentives in terms of having, uh, you know, carbon uh, um, taxes or uh, slapping those, uh, you know, uh, negative connotations in terms of, you know, how they can reduce and encourage more fair play, or I would say uh, a level playing field for all the industry players. So an encouragement of policies in terms of having subsidies or even, uh, you know, having policies like carbon taxes uh, or, or a Having a level playing field with it with regards to Europe on what what they are doing in terms of you know uh, carbon policies, uh, I think it's very important and it it's encouraging to see that you know India is also having its own own roadmap and having its own center of excellence uh, with with the launch of even green hydrogen mission. It's very important that you know how we can utilize that uh, uh, platform in terms of encouraging more utilization of uh, such uh, alternative fuels and we can drive more on the implementation part. I believe um, <clears throat> just to point out on one aspect where uh, we would want to focus more on and uh, speaking with different stakeholders, I think India 
um, sort of wants to look at more on the policy perspective, uh, create that uh, platform for the industry players to uh, sort of uh, encourage them to adopt such sustainable fuels and sort of um, move towards more on the implementation side, because I see that, you know, uh, policies are one aspect uh, definitely, but having more encouragement in terms of implementation with with, with, with even regards to, you know, the R&D uh, or technology uh, 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 initiatives or policy, or I would say uh, um, different pilot project scales would also sort of be an, an, uh, you know, uh, a driver in terms of looking at how industry is shaping well. So I think on that perspective, it's very imperative that we see how different um, uh, solutions such as I've mentioned in terms of, you know, and these these drivers could sort of place uh, other alternative fuels, including methanol, and driving the, the the shipping industry to decarbonize. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prakriti. Uh, may I ask you a small question? You know, you talked about um, the green hydrogen mission, which uh, Government of India has announced. So. The fact that there is a green hydrogen mission, and then you we, you are talking about sustainable fuels. So, where do you see the future of methanol in this entire ecosystem? I think uh, when you talk about uh, green hydrogen uh, mission document, uh, we have been part of the discussions with with a lot of ministries in terms of um, catering to the demand of green hydrogen. So, about eleven percent of um, you know, um, green hydrogen demand, uh, green methanol demand comes from, uh, you know, methanol. So I think it's very important that we target that 11% of green methanol um, uh, demand coming from, uh, you know, looking at the green hydrogen side. So I think that is very important that we cater to that uh, beyond ammonia and the fertilizer industry, because it's it's important that we are, we're talking about uh, in most of the discussions uh, about the cost of green hydrogen. But we we need to also sort of address the demand side as well. And I think methanol will definitely play an important role um, in, in sort of diversifying uh, and catering to a demand market, which accounts to about 11%. So I think it's a, it's, it's a good good number um, that, that, you know, green hydrogen mission uh, could, could cater to. And uh, I believe that, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's very important that we see that, uh, you know, uh, within this context, uh, you know, methanol uh, definitely is very complementary and it can diversify the energy mix because when you have green hydrogen, you eventually could sort of venture into as uh, one of the derivatives into one of the, you know, uh, different different uh, demand fuel markets as well. And not only uh, just as a chemical product, but also looking at, you know, uh, different transport um, segments like heavy duty. There is already a discussion in terms of utilizing methanol for heavy duty segment uh, for industrial applications. And shipping industries, of course, seems to be one of the most promising, uh, you know, industry looking at uh, methanol uh, demand drivers. Um, I mean, there is another segment that we are also exploring in terms of methanol gensets. So how green methanol or renewable methanol could be utilized for methanol gensets. So I think um, not just looking at uh, particularly um, the demand side, uh, just the supplier side, but it's important that we also see how we can derive uh, this chicken and egg situation and sort of strengthen the, you know, uh, demand for green hydrogen through um, uh, through the implementation of, um, you know, methanol applications as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Patrick, yeah. we are privileged to have you here with us. So let's hear your thoughts on this. Okay. Um, it's very interesting to hear about the targets. The targets are really important. They're very ambitious and they're getting more ambitious over time. Um, well, let me make an analogy with something we've been doing in Europe in the area of urban development. We have something called the Covenant of Mayors, where the cities and towns announce their ambitions for net zero. And about 10,000 you know, entities have announced public ambitions for net zero. But in actual fact, they found it very hard to measure exactly where they are and measure the progress that they're making. And so for me, a, a major concern is that we can easily underestimate the role of reporting. So we can set the target, and we, we know that people under pressure fudge the numbers. Now, this is human nature. It happens all the time, and it's only going to get worse, you know, because the pressure for results is mounting. So this is one of the reasons why I think that we, we really need to do 
more on the ground work on reporting, etc. And not just on the fuel uh, issue, because, um, well, for example, one of the legislations that's coming down the, the road in Europe is something called the Green Claims Directive. And in the Green Claims Directive, it means that if you have a, a product on a shelf that says this is climate friendly or carbon neutral or something like that, you have to prove that this is the case or you cannot make the claim. And a lot of companies want to make that claim because it gives them a competitive advantage, a good story to tell to the consumer. And a part of their footprint is in transport and logistics, etc. So part of the information, the, the role of accounting for carbon and sustainability in, in sectors like maritime is not just about decarbonizing the, the transport, but in providing every other business on earth, you know, or every other <clears throat> product on earth with a basis for demonstrating the progress it is making as well. So the scope of reporting goes beyond the obvious in that sense. And there's another issue that we started off, we talk about carbon, but recent legislation tells us that low carbon isn't good enough. It has to be sustainable. And in the future, well, right now, what we worry about is deforestation, impact on biodiversity, and these are existential issues. So we might kick the can down the road a little bit, but we're not going to avoid them forever, and we have to deal with them. Tomorrow, it could be water. Water is a terrible problem in many parts of the world, and to make biofuels or any kind of fuels, you need access to things like water, and then there's the issue of we spoke about the justice and an equitable transition, et cetera. And uh, earlier I mentioned the, the farmers in Belgium with the, about 6,000 tractors on the Place Luxembourg, uh, you know, blocking traffic. The farmers are really angry because they are not being treated fair. And it could be farmers anywhere in the world because it's a universal problem. I would say also in, in India, they're very interesting and progressive uh, policies in India to help the farmers uh, progress. But this is another area of reporting that's under ESG reporting. And corporates everywhere have to report on, on this stuff. So I think it, it's useful to step back a little and look at the total burden of reporting. Because if we fragment it too much, we'll end up paying 10 times for something that maybe should only be done, done once. And, and in the end, we place an unreasonable burden on whoever has to do the reporting. So really, this is my kind of plea in a sense. You know, that I see amazing things going on. And, I'm, I, you know, it blows my sock up, you know, to see the progress on engines and the targets, et cetera. But I think that there will be no real progress until we, we grasp the method of reporting. And not just on fuel, but on the broader range of issues relating to trade, et cetera, where the shipping companies have a really important role to play as well. Excellent. Uh, yes, reporting is another dimension. I mean, I don't know uh, to what extent we are capturing the uh, kind of data in the SEBI, uh, the BR, uh, yes. BRSR regulations, but that's something uh, food for thought, uh, that the shipping industry also needs to, you know, disclose the data, I mean, the, the people who are using the fuels uh, for the uh, these purposes, they need to disclose it somewhere. And where is it being captured at the moment? What kind of modifications we can do so that the people know and uh, the people, not just the regulators, but also the people who are using it, the demand side also needs to know about it. So thank you very much. Uh, so last but not the least speaker today, <laughs> Mr. Sanjay Nagare, uh, over to you, sir, for your thoughts on this. He has to make it possible, yeah. <laughs> I don't think too much of a time. Like, I understand Delhi traffic is bad. I'll let you go as soon as possible. But I'll just take two minutes. Let me just introduce myself. Like, uh, I come from Okure Energy. We are developing uh, to green ammonia plants, green hydrogen to ammonia plants. Uh, one is in uh, Odisha in India, and one is in Egypt. Uh, both are million tons uh, green ammonia plant <laughs> with around 4,000, 4,500 megawatts of capacity in the plant. Up there. So it's a complete, basically, renewable energy to green ammonia. Now, 
one interesting point which uh, was basically mentioned like uh, i think ingrid mentioned that that is on our demand side uh you know we see all other aspects all other levers they seem to be working but the demand side is something which there's a lot of interest but we are not seeing too many ppas or basically agreements where the ink is hitting the paper that's not happening now in india uh, interestingly like uh, we had a very successful renewable energy industry it's a very successful journey we started small and today renewables is one of the biggest basically energy generation source in india uh we had a carrot and stick policy kind of a thing we what we did was we mandated each distribution company in india to basically buy a certain percentage of their power from the renewable sources we called it renewable purchase obligation so in government of india today they are contemplating something on the similar lines for fertilizer steel and refineries this is what they are contemplating right it's not a basically it is not done deal but they are thinking on those lines they are waiting some percentage has to come from green hydrogen and green hydrogen derivatives so what it does it basically gives a push to the industry i still remember like uh, first ppa i signed for renewable energy it was a small 2 megawatt plant and i had a tariff of 20 cents 20 cents per kilowatt hour i last ppi i had done that was a 1000 megawatt ppa that was that 3 cents in fact less than 2.75 cents we made that journey from 20 to 2.75 we scaled up you know the technological advances came in which basically brought the cost down similar thing is possible in green hydrogen also we say that uh, you know if we talk about maritime we say that it's a small demand like what is the total size is what 3% of the total emissions but that 3% is equivalent to 35 to 40 million tons of ammonia and each million ton of ammonia is 5 billion dollar capex you know that's the scale so that's how we need to basically approach this thing so i think there has to be some hand holding from the state side like in terms of cfds in terms of basically some support for the suppliers to basically come in and the the buyers also to feel comfortable that they will be able to do that in a sustainable manner that has to be done i think us has done a good job they have announced their uh, you know they have announced the incentives indian government has done a little bit of it we are asking them for more hopefully let's see where it goes but those things have started happening similarly eu has done some good job so i think that's where we need to focus as an industry we need to focus on we need to make it happen i think it won't happen till the time you have bankable supply agreements which are acceptable to the lenders and another thing which we need to look at the thought process when you are buying let's say methanol or bunker or diesel it's a very spot oriented mindset whereas these are new capacities which are going to come in and if the new capacities are going to come in they have to be financed if they have to be financed the lenders are going to ask for you know offtake which is a longer duration offtake minimum 10 to 15 years they are going to ask how do we educate the buyers in terms of that you know you need to get out that spot mindset that's going to be critical i think that's where all of us need to work we need to work with buyers also end of the day they also have a point are we buying it at let's say a particular x price for every shipment you know why do you want me to lock in my prices for 20 years would i be able to pass on this cost to my customers so are genuine issues so i think all of us as an industry we need to sit down decide how we want to address it And both sides need to come together and make it happen i think that will be all from my side at this time very good sir uh, very important point of ocean and uh, also an important element in the entire uh, strategy uh, so we have to look at both demand side as well as the supply side as uh, issues of technology availability of fuels issues of reporting 
so with this, we have come to the end of this session. It's an extremely enriching and uh, um, the two presentations were outstanding. So thank you very much. And let me thank all the panelists. If uh, Over to my co-chair, if she has any thoughts at this stage. All I can say is thank you for a nice <laughs> discussion. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much, much for Terry and having made this possible. Over to Apurva. Uh, um, Savik. Thank you to all the speakers and our chair and co-chair for moderating this session. We now have a small uh, token of appreciation from our side for all the speakers. Terry supports the local farmers uh, of Supi village in Uttarakhand. It's a hilly state in India and we help them in livelihood generation by adopting sustainable practices. Uh, agriculture practices. So I would request Ara Rashmi sir to please present that to all the speakers. Thank you. Ladies first, please. Ladies first. Okay. Thank you.